Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to begin this series towards a fair and sustainable food system for Europe. And I wanted to thank the Green Transition Foundation for this important bet they're waging because they are considering from a local, regional, European and global perspective the different aspects of this food system. Obviously, I want to thank all the speakers who are here today with us for their time, for their knowledge and for bringing all of that to this debate. And in La Casa On, this virtual space, we are going to start the autumn, the fall period with this online series. And since we still have this possibility of finding ourselves in this space, we want to be able to talk about these topics that obviously are important for so many countries. So thank you all and to all of you who are here. And I'm sure that we will all be able to bring to the debate quite a lot. So with no further ado, I would like to give the floor to Pepe Lario so that he can begin this series of conferences with his opening words. Hello, good afternoon. I am Pepe Larios. I am the president of the Green Transition Foundation. And we have been organizing different series, some with La Casa Encendida and others in person. And we wanted to thank La Casa Encendida for the extraordinary, extraordinary welcome that they have given us during the pandemic. Otherwise, we would not have been able to carry on with our activities. So thank you so much for your support. And we have been looking at different topics about cities, economic systems, um, ecologic transition. And we thought that agriculture was a fundamental element in these cycles. Why? Well, because if we go towards a society that will no longer use fossil fuels, then we also have to think about how we're going to feed ourselves. And we also have to think about how that transition is going to take place, because what we currently have is mainly based on the use of fossil fuels in agriculture. So for that to happen, we have initiated this series of conferences. You know that there will be five different sessions, and we're going to talk about the soil today, which is vital for the growth of plants and food production. Then we will talk on September 27th, we will also talk about another fundamental element, which is water. And then we will see what hides behind food, fast food, cheap food, what's behind it. And then we will take a look at how food sovereignty can be built as opposition to agribusiness and big corporations. And lastly, we will try, well, not try, we will understand what's the path to follow, what's the line to be followed. We understand that that path is that of agro, um, eco agriculture. So this series has been organized by the Green Transition Foundation with the support of, of the Green European Foundation and the valuable support of the Spanish Association for Eco Ecology which is the association that has allowed for this series to take place. And with no further ado, in order not to waste more of your time, I'm going to give the floor to Maria Jose Paya, who is replacing Dolores Recon, the president of the Spanish Association for Bioagriculture and, Agri and Ecoagriculture, who has not been able to make it today with us. Maria, Maria Jose Paya is is um, an engineer in agriculture. She also has a PhD in biological agriculture. She has worked as a technician in cooperatives in rural development, and she is currently teaching in a high school. And she is going to coordinate today's session. And we are very happy to be with all of you here today. Thank you, Pepe. Well, 
I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for your presentation. Although I do not have a PhD, it's a master's degree. But who knows, maybe one day I will teach, a, I will um, get my PhD. So today's session, as Pepe has already explained, is that about protecting soil, which is the first se the first session of this five, se five session si series towards a just and sustainable food system. And I'm glad that the first session is dedicated to soil because of the importance it has and because it is very much the unknown and it has always been uh, left aside. It's the crypto system that Antonio Bello talked about. It is the great unknown. It is not seen, but it's there and it's very important. And that is why it's so important for us to study it and take care of it. And chemical agriculture has been killing it for decades, degradating it and eroding it. So during this session, we are going to try and understand how the soil works, what's happening to it and how to regenerate it so that it can keep on being the perfect home for agriculture. And so that it can still keep on capturing CO2 in order to mitigate climate change. So the first thing I wanted to do was remind you of the fact that there is simultaneous translation. So you can always choose uh, below, on um, the bottom right-hand side button, you'll see a globe, um, a globe icon. You can click on it and choose the channel you want to, you want to be following the session in, either English or Spanish. And you have to write your questions on the chat and we will read them and we will be asking questions at the end of the session. So. Today's speakers are Pilar Andres, who is a biologist and has a PhD in um, science of the soul. She is a researcher in the Spanish Center for, for Forestry, and she has worked for 30 years in the diagnosis and restoration of soil due to the hum human behavior. She has worked in the um, in the Biodiversity Atlas of the EU, and she has also worked for FAO in the state of biodiversity. Then we have Ray Archuleta, who is a specialist in soil, quality of water, and regenerative agriculture. He has worked for 30 years in the Conservation Center for Natural Resources in the US, and he has been working since 2017 uh, in order to repair soil and being a trainer with regards to ecosystems in the soil. In 2020, he participated in the Netflix documentary Kiss the Ground, which I'm sure many of you already know of and have seen, and he showed how good a communicator he is, and we will have the pleasure of having him today. Then Andre, oh, I'm sorry, Andres Gomez is a, an engineer, in, agri in agro in agro agriculture and he is a member of uh, Lejab and he is um, a member of Gran Jazael, which is regenerative um, farming and in Burgos and then we have Andre Novakowski who is a consultant for agriculture for the greens in the EU and he is finishing uh, the reform of the common agriculture policy for 2021. He has been working for 20 years in including new agricultural models that will protect biodiversity. He also has been working as a volunteer in um, ARC 2020 and Pesticide Action Network. So that's all I wanted to say. I just would ask the speakers to please stick to the time that was given to them, 10 to 12 minutes maximum, except for Ray, who will uh, get a total of 20 minutes, which I hope he will respect because we want for all of the people who are here today connected may have time to ask questions so that we can have a fruitful debate in the end. And with no further ado, I will give the floor to Pilar, who's going to give us the basis for today's debate. She's going to talk about the soil, and which is the, the topic on the table today. So Pilar, why is it so important to talk about the soil? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So I wanted to talk not so much about the soil, but rather the biodiversity of the soil, which is 
what we have um, been able to learn in the 20th century, we have changed the paradigm. We have gone from a physical chemical conception of the soul to a biological conception of the soul. I work in biodiversity and that is what I would, if you'll allow me, want to talk about. So this is the great unknown. So I really thank you for this window you're offering me to tell you a bit more about this topic. Okay. So during these next 10 minutes, I wanted to introduce to you the fascinating world of biodiversity. Unfortunately, we can keep on saying what Leonardo da Vinci already said in the 17th century, at the beginning of the 19th, 17th century. We know more about the stars and planets than we do know about the soil we step on. And we have made some progress in these last four, four centuries, but we still have the feeling that we haven't made as much progress as we should. So during the last, second half of the 20th century, we really changed the situation. We went from the classic agronomical concept that consider that the capacity of a, of a soil, a fertile soil and healthy soil, because at the time we always thought that the soil only was useful if it could, um, could have plants grow so that it could produce goods. That was the only good soil and so that we could build upon it. So at that time and until then, a healthy soil, a soil in a, in a good situation with a good status was good because it had the physical and chemical characteristics that would assure, ensure productivity. But after we saw the disaster that the Green um, Revolution had made, we started making progress and that has led us to the current situation. We have seen a change towards an integrative and biological concept of soil. The soil offers, as we will see later on, a wide array of, of services to the society, environmental services and a, a soil comme il faut, as it should be, a well-preserved soil is that which has the organisms that are capable of satisfying the needs of plants and animals. So the organisms of the soil now become the protagonists without leaving aside the physical and chemical status of the soil, which I will try to show you today, depends on the biodiversity of the soil itself. So what is that biodiversity, this fascinating biodiversity? Well, at least it's fascinating to me and those of us who work with it. So for you to understand the situation we're facing, I have shown you here a table that was created in 2012. We have made some progress, as you can see. You have on the um, yellow column, you have all the elements of biodiversity in soil organized in a simple way by sizes microbes microfauna which is smaller than a tenth of a millimeter a mesofauna which is all the elements that are 0 0.1 to 2 millimeters and then macrofauna which would be 2 to 20 millimeters from macrofauna, uh, we had at least around 400,000 species, mesofauna around 39,000, and microfauna 9,000, and at the time, my microbes around 53,000 species. Well, what is uh, worrisome about this situation, and I'm referring to the opposed column, is the f that shows the percentage of species described um, over the ones that we think exist. So what percentage do we know of biodiversity? And that's the situation in the microbiological space. It's one to 5%, depending on whether they're bacteria, fungi, or virus. And we don't even know what's the proportion that we actually have. And obviously the proportion, if we go down to the biggest um, elements, it's greater, but it's, but it's not something to be happy about. We only have half of the species that supposedly exist for the biggest elements, such as termites, um, ants, um, you know, centipedes, and so on. So why is there such um, a lack of knowledge with regards to microbiota? Well, it's due to the fact that only 
10% of the species of microbe species in the soil can be cultivated. So uh, th people think about microbiologists doing uh, cultures in their, in their labs. They can only identify 10% of the uh, microbes in the soil because they would not survive outside of the soil. So we cannot find them. And what has been very useful is the development of gen genomics because it is making us progress quite quickly in these last few years. This was something unexpected for many centuries with regards to the knowledge of biodiversity. So that you get an idea, grosso modo, in general, of the of what we're talking about in sizes, here you have the picture beside it. In a gram of soil, we could have around 10 million and one and um, a billion of microbian um, cells and we would have around a million of bacteria and archaeas which are the, the cousins of bacteria and they could weigh around uh, tw 20 uh, kilo and 20 tons of carbon under the soil due to this biota which means that under a hectare we would have around eight cows um, eight cows but divided in small pieces so this is the amazing situation we find ourselves in so the good thing about biodiversity is that it is fascinating when you look at it up close. In the soil, there are elements, there are pores that are filled with water or they're empty, but there are also elements that belong to the, um, the aerial world, such as fungi and disinvertebrated bugs. And then we have things that belong to water. We have oceans under the soil. There are rivers, there are lakes under the soil. Bacteria would rather be in the water. And you have elements such as this ones that go from algae, rotifers. And for those of you who wonder what this uh, creature in the left is, well, this is the same patron of those of us who love the biodiversity in the soil. If you like this thing, then I will talk to you about it later on, if that is of interest to you. So why do you have this craziness, this, this, why has the soil biodiversity become a hot topic right now? Why is it in all the international programs for absolute protection? Well, it is due to the fact that we have discovered in the last few years that out of the 11 kinds of environmental services that the uh, United Nations has described for, for food and agriculture, so FAO has identified that the soil uh, offers all these things to human societies, and eight of them are the ones that are um, highlighted in red, are the ones that are strongly impacted or controlled by all of these elements that I have just talked about. As you can see, these are extraordinary elements. They're very powerful and important to the development of human societies. We have on the one hand, well, yes, I actually want to, um, I know we don't have much time, so I want to really highlight some of them and then you can ask me as many questions as you want. If we talk about CO2 capture, we have to say that the amount of CO2 present in the soil in a column, in an average column in the world is is always greater than the one that is in the vegetation and the atmosphere. So the great warehouse of CO2 is the soil. So if we add to that what's in the vegetation and the atmosphere, it's amazing. That is for you to understand what it means to degrade the soil, because the soil, depending on how its biodiversity works, because they are the organisms of the trophic network of the soil, this soil biota, they are responsible with their metabolism for the soil to, uh, capture, to capture CO2 or emit CO2. So we can either be the, the it can be the storage space or the emitting a vector of CO2, and it depends on the state of its biodiversity and how we manage it. If we go to, uh, we have obviously the uh, climate regulation, and you get an idea of why it's so important because of what I told you previously about CO2 capture, but the soil biota doesn't only regulate CO2, it also regulates the emission and control of other gases, other uh, greenhouse gas and gases such as nitrogen and, and a series of, of gases that have a very high potential for, for um, 
global warming and for our climate. Now, as for the nutrient cycle, I understand that you'll, you'll know that the soil biota is the one that degrades all the vegetable remains and waste, organic waste and animal waste that ends up in the soil. So either through the surface or through the roots, I will tell you about it. The plants kind of give carbon constantly to the soil through their through the roots and they give it to the biota that surrounds them and then this recycling of nutrients eating up while the plants leave and turn it once again into into nutrients that can be reabsorbed by plants so that they can keep on producing that that um, plant material is is what regulates the climate but but obviously it depends on the fertility and the production of fiber and food now as for the habitat for organisms, I wanted to share something important with you, which has been found um, in the last few years, which is the fact that, well, we previously thought that plant biodiversity was what controlled soil biodiversity, but we now know that soil biodiversity can influence greatly the uh, plants that we will have in the surface, what sort of plants and what structure we'll have. Now, as for the regulation of flooding, it is the elements of biodiversity in the soil which collaborate in order to try and create aggregates in the soil and structure the soil. So their capacity to retain water and to have water being infiltrated and thus regulating the, the flow of water that falls on the ground to, to try and better manage this growth in rivers and so on so that they don't impact us. And finally, and it's very important, the biodiversity of the soil is also the, pro uh, the production of genetic resources and resources for drugs. And this is not just for big pharma to work, but the biota in the soil is that which gives a natural protection to plants against diseases and against the attacks of fungi, of nematodes, or many pathogens, really, to the extent that these are what we call the protectors. There are soils that, due to the biodiversity that they have, they manage to, to fight against a plague, or a plague will not be able to attack the plants that are in that area. As you can see, it's it's important. I mean, the importance that, that um, soil has is is quite obvious and plants already knew this because plants are um, smarter than us. And as I was telling you previously, as an average, the plants after making all of that effort that they do for photosynthesis and capturing carb, uh, CO2, 20 to 40% of, of their effort, they give it to the soil through their root, to all the elements of biodiversity of soil because they know they need it because they know that without them, there's nothing they can do. So in order to finish, I wanted to just uh, leave you with a certain thought, which is the fact that if you have you have all of this summarized, all of the environmental services that soil biodiversity offers to ecosystems, and you have from zero to 100 the protection that each of these services provides. And we have to say that in the natural ecosystem, if you look um, to the left-hand side down corner, you will see that there's a black star. Well, in a natural ecosystem, the productivity of different different cultures is actually quite low and they're very much I mean, the rest of the services are at the maximum yield. Well, what we manage with intensive agriculture and the degradation of soil and biodiversity is achieve exactly the opposite, maximize the production at the expense of killing absolutely every other environmental service. What we're looking for with an improved agriculture and with a respectful treatment of soil is to manage a multifunctionality so that we may have all the services that we need in a harmonized way. And it would also allow us to better treat the soil, something that would allow for a biodiversity because the resilience of 
the resilience of our soil also depends on its biodiversity. That's what allows it to resist stress and to recover after uh, the impacts of climate change. So I will leave you with a recommendation when you have time, stop for a bit and look at the soil quite up close. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Pilar. Okay, so we will now give the floor to, to Ray Artueta, who is going to talk to us about this degradation that industrial agriculture has caused and how we can revert this. So Ray, the floor is yours and so is the screen. Good morning here in the Missouri. Can everybody hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, very good. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about what I was not taught after eight years of college. This is the new paradigm, biomimicry, emulating intelligent design, an agriculture of healing and forgiveness. This is the new paradigm that we should be teaching throughout the country and the world. What I was taught was it's all about yield. It's about quantity, not quality. It's about making money and it's about controlling nature. That's what I was taught. Once I understand the correct paradigm, I went and flew all, all over the country from every to Alaska, to Puerto Rico, to Hawaii, to teach millions and millions of miles to teach this new awesome paradigm to mimic nature. Like Pilar mentioned, biodiversity, one of my favorite words, biodiversity. So I traveled all over the country because in reality, I'll be honest with you, I had no hope for agriculture, none. After many, many miles, I've seen that the land was very degraded. Working for the government, we have spent, we were asked for Congress for 86 years to fix this problem. And this is still a problem. This picture was taken in the left in Colorado, 2014. The picture in 1935, notice that picture. Look at the color of the soil, how dark. 1935, that was in an organic system, no chemicals, just slowly bad grazing, poor management, and huge amounts of tillage, how destructive tillage is. Most people forget that, and they don't understand, the biggest problem is not global warming, it's global ignorance, global disconnectedness to the land. We have, uh, most of the planet is the soil throughout the planet is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. We have too much sensible heat coming off the soil surface, and it's affecting the climate even more severely than CO2. I'll explain that in a second. As the soil temperatures increase, notice the white soil temperatures are increasing globally. So why is that such a big deal? As the temperatures increase, you also increase water vapor. New, new models in NASA show that the biggest gas that affects climate, even more than CO2, is water vapor. CO2 is only three or four percent. This water vapor, this 16 kilometer thick water vapor, has more capacity of holding gases. So what regulates that? Living plants. Plants make a huge difference. The problem is we don't have enough living plants on the soil surface. So what is causing the biggest problem in throughout the globe right here? I tell farmers, the biggest problem is you're the problem between your ears. My wife tells me, husband, you are 99% of your problem. It's what's between our ears. It's the way we look at soils in the natural ecosystem. Our parents, from my grandparents, our parents, from our schools, a majority of them are just plain wrong. So here are the three basic things that I noticed when I traveled throughout the whole country and through parts of the world in Mexico. The three biggest problems I see first is most farmers and ranchers don't understand that the soil is alive. It is the most complex ecosystem on the planet. 25% of all biodiversity is in the soil. The second one, humans are really not good at this. It's called relationships, understanding how things are connected. Ecology, all is one. Quantum physics teaches all is one. Ecology teaches all is one. 
Theology teaches all is one. We're not good of understanding connectness and relationship. And the last one, this is the most frustrating for me when I left school. Did not realize that the goal was to mimic nature, understand its principles, its patterns, and its structure and its design. Cover crops is not the goal. Organic farming is not the goal. Biometismo, uh, biomimicry is the goal. This is the first thing I tell farmers. If you do not understand that the soil is a living organism like what you see here, you will not change your operation. You won't change the way you graze. You will not change the way you plant crops. Second, relationship. Understand connectness. Why is that so important? Because when you go out there with your tools of pesticides and chemicals, if you do not understand that all is connected, you're not going to understand the unintended consequences by your farming or ranching. This is the connectness we're talking about. All these organisms are connected. They're interlinked. This, this is the software of the planet, biodiversity. The planet would be nothing but rock and ice without living organisms, plants, bacteria. This is the software. Your cell phone is worthless without software. This is the software of the planet. Life, living interconnected organisms keeps this planet from being rock and ice. It's alive. This is a great video showing on the top of the surface, these living organisms. So the more you, you picture on the right, this little video shows earthworms breaking down the detritosphere, the residue, all these living organisms. They're the transformer. They're, they're the nutrient cycle. They're the completion of the water cycle. Without these organisms, there would be no life, period, period. No plant, no soil, no climate. It's just as simple as that. So this is the agriculture that we're talking about. The agriculture on the left is the current model. It has no respect or relationship to the soil. This is the new agriculture we're promoting in the United States. We are rolling our cover crops and we are mimicking the natural system. We are mimicking the architecture of the forest and the prairie, and we are rolling, we're planting corn, soybean, cotton into this living cover, feeding it to the last minute. Notice the difference. The one on the right, relationship. The one on the left, no relationship. This is the model that I promoted on the left. Treating, that, treating nature like a factory, like a machine. This is causing a lot of people in our country not wanting to eat meat. We are now promoting what the, the, the natural design was intended, mimicking nature, letting the pigs express their design. This is the same thing in our livestock systems. And unfortunately, we promoted this agriculture throughout the world. Most of the world mimic because of the efficiency. The system in the left is efficient in producing quantity of food that's healthy. The quality is poor. The quality on the right is what our bodies were designed. This is where we're changing. The model on the left is destroying the planet and our health. One critical thing I have learned to understand, plant and soil are one. All things are connected. This is the most important thing we can do on our farm and ranch. This is a living root, leaking liquid sun, hundreds and hundreds of compounds to feed microbes, to feed this living organisms. Notice this is a living soil. This photo came from a video came from a farmer who does cover crops, no tillage and animals on his land. Notice cover crops, no till and, and livestock integration. All of us throughout the world have something in common in our soils, geology, sand, silt, and clay. But what changes is how much life you incorporate through the right, correct practices. Geology plus the byproducts of life, you have soil. This is what Pilar was talking about. These are aggregates. 
This is what causes infiltration. This is the aggregate, it's the fusion of sand, silts, and clays to create those bibby, BBs, aggregates, chocolate cake. This aggregates change every 28 days. This is why a lot of our land is not infiltrating because it takes a lot of energy to create aggregates. If you see this picture on the left, this is Illinois, this is Pennsylvania, same time in the early spring. A majority of our country is not covered from California to North Carolina. The soil is bare on the left. We are not capturing sun. On the, left, on the right, the farmer has planted cover crops. We want to make the planet green again. This is what's destroying our farms because we don't understand that our soils are alive. We are destroying it through tillage, overhaying, too much pesticides, too much fertilizers, too much chemicals, all because we do not understand connectedness and life. The reality is most of our soils were like in the left, the prairies and the forests, eight to 14%. Now our soils are what you see in the right. This is where our soils are at, monocultures and destroyed soils. So what is it causing in our country? Majority of our farmers, a large percentage of farmers are creating, a, are, are having um, suicide, high suicide rate. Our country has one, of, agriculture has one of the highest suicide rates of any type of career in the United States. Why? Because of this, since the 1920s to the 2016, the high cost of inputs, fertilizer, chemicals, Anything that's run on ancient sunlight, diesel, fertilizer, pesticides. Look at the income in the green. No income. Farmers have been going broke for a long time. So where has the money gone? To the tool makers. So let's look at the objective. This is the objective. Even in the ancient scriptures in the Bible told us what the goal was. Mimic nature. Watch the beast, watch the trees, watch the design. It's been there for a long, long time. Mimic the design. This is what my goal is now. I teach farmers how to emulate the prairie and the forest. Look at the architecture. Look at the beauty of diversity. Always covered, always green, always having animals. That's what we're teaching. This is the architecture, the architecture on top with the architecture on the bottom. This is what we want. We are using cover crop mixes that mimic the prairie and the forest. Millions of acres now are being planted like this in the United States. And we're planting our corn and soybean and cotton all into this mix. We are using these pieces of equipment. Most people thought that was just a sprayer for chemicals. It drops cover crop seed on standing corn. As we harvest the corn, the cover crop grows and you do not leave the ground bare. One of the worst things we can do in agriculture is to leave the soil bare through the fall and the winter and the spring. Look what we're doing now. We are rolling the cover crop down and we are planting corn and soybean on millions of acres, great weed suppression. We are re reducing our chemicals, our fertilizers by a huge amount by mimicking nature. Nature always has residue, a skin on the soil surface. This is happening on millions of acres and it is spreading. We are so excited about this. And look at the result. Look at the corn pop right out of that. That cereal-rised aleopathic suppresses weeds, keeps the soil surface cool, reduces herbicides, reduces uh, rain impact. And where you have a residue layer, you have no problem with soil. Look at Rick Clark, 2,832 hectares. No tillage, organic. Look what he's done on his place in Indiana. He has reduced his cost by no more tillage, no more chemicals, no more fertilizer by mimicking nature, $670,000 to $800,000.
People say, well, regenerative agriculture doesn't pay. It does pay. Look where the, the money goes to him. It doesn't go to the chemical companies, to the fertilizer companies, to the tillage companies. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not against tools. I'm against farmers going broke. Look at the cotton that we're growing. Look at how we roll the cover crop down. Look at the cotton coming right out of it. We're doing it on tomatoes. We're doing it on pumpkins. We're doing it on squash. We're doing it on small acres. Here, where I went to college at New Mexico State down in New Mexico, we used to grow pecans this way, leave the ground bare. I was taught in college, you do not put plants next to the trees because they're going to compete. That's what we were taught in school. Wrong. That was absolutely wrong. Does competition happen? Yes, it does. But nature's overall, overall principle is collaboration. We do this now with our orchards. We are rolling the covers. Now no more insect pressures. We have habitat. There are 1,700 beneficials for every pest. 1,700 beneficials for every pest. Now that we created a habitat, they share resources. We reduce water use, chemical use. It's exciting. So now we're also mimicking the natural systems in our grazing in the United States. Where are we, where are we learning this from? Mimicking nature. Let me take you to Mexico, some of the best grazers in the world. There's Jesus Almira, Gabe Brown, Alejandro, and Jesus Paolo, and myself going to Mexico because I always worried, how in the world are we going to fix our deserts and make them back into prairies? Look at Alejandro. Look at his goal. Don't fight with nature. Mimic it. Work with it. Let me show you some perspective here. I, went, I was raised uh, in New Mexico, and you can see in the northern part, that's the Chihuahuan Desert, largest desert in Mexico, in, New, in the United States. I'm going to show you an operation with 10,000 hectares, 600 cows, 125 to 279 milliliters of, of rain, millimeters of rain, fourth generation rancher. Give you some context. Look at the Native Americans. Look at the foreground. Grasses. It was a prairie. It was a prairie. This is the problem now. Most of the United States, the western part of the United States looks like this. It has become desertified by overgrazing. And people want to blame the cow. It's not the cow. It's the how. It's the human. Let me show you how hot cows can heal the land. Look at the erosion with only 125 to 279 millimeters. Very little rain, but a lot of erosion. Look at Alejandro's neighbor. It takes 101 hectares just to raise one cow. 101 hectares just for one cow. Look at Alejandro's by mimicking nature. Eight hectares for one cow. Look how he's healing the desert and making it back into a prairie. All archaeologists now know that most of the planet, all the planet was vegetated. They have found in Saudi Arabia elephant tusks. All the planet was vegetated. Look at Alejandro. So how did Alejandro turn the desert? Right here. Infrastructure. Look at the infrastructure. Water tanks. The right fencing. Look at one hot wire to separate so they can move the cows. They use the cows. Look at the height of the cow. He's got feed. Manure through the urine, through the hoofs, they bring seed and they move the seed to one area to the other. Look at Alejandro's dad, 83 years old. That grass was not planted. Cows through manure and urine and stimulation brought the seed bank. We'll look up ecological memory and look at the results. Alejandro's ranch on the left, the vecinos, the neighbors on the right. Look where the rain is dropping. It is plants that bring the rain. 40% of our rain comes from living plants. So the idea is to change, understand where you're at and how degraded the system is. Look at our new bosses, folks. The farm, this is our new boss. We are gonna get away from this model 
and we're going to get away from fake beef, but to this paradigm. Let thy food be thy medicine. Let thy food be thy medicine. It is important how we raise our food. So wrapping it up, these are the three principal things, things I observe. Soils alive, understand relationship, understand that everything is connected. Many people say we can't raise enough food. This is the Devra's family from Pasadena. They can raise 6,000 pounds of vegetables in a tiny lot. So what am I promoting? A new design, a new way of looking at things. Our biomimicry is this design. It should be beautiful. It should be gorgeous. It should have life. It should be diverse. Last slide, folks. If you want to do small changes, change the way you do things. But if you want to do major changes, change the way you see things. Remember, the land is a reflection of you. Thank you so much, Pilat. And I just made it in 38 seconds. How do you like that, Pilar? Eh, muchas gracias. Es verdad, justo, vamos, en los 20 minutos exactos que tenías. Gracias, Rey, ha sido, ha sido un reto. That was an amazing challenge, but you made it. Thank you so much. Okay, that was a great presentation that tackles lots of different topics and makes us really think. And I will now give the floor to Andres Gómez who is going to talk to us about his experience as a livestock farmer in the Ithael farm and what are the changes that took place in the soil ever since he started with this new management of livestock. So Andres, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share one short presentation to try and give you some images of what I'm saying so that you can see what I say. I'm going to be very fast and try and say lots of things in the short time I've, I was given and I'm going to talk about a very specific project here in Spain in Burgos. The project is called Gran Jazael. It's regenerative livestock um, in, the, in Castilla, in one of the most in, um, one of the, the areas that have been most impacted by intensive agriculture. So this is the meseta in between Castilla León and Castilla La Mancha are the cereal areas in, the, um, in Spain, Long, big extensions of terrain where there is intensive monocultures with cereals, especially these, uh, these cereals that don't require much water. So I come from this area and I didn't see any alternative to this to these bottles, but I I discovered regenerative livestock farming, and I thought it was an opportunity to to change this. I thought there was hope, and I thought we needed to put it in place. And I thought that I wanted to do it at home so that people could see that there are alternatives that are real, that are possible. And I hope that this will be used as an example for others so that they can consider the possibility of changing. So. A few brushstrokes. It is it is a very young project. I started in 2019. It is um, mainly cows, following the holistic management principles. The um, it's all ecologic. It is certified, and I would like to say that there are very little spaces for for. Uh, for this, because there was a green revolution, and there were some. Um, there were some areas where there were some livestock, but now the farmers have eaten up all the areas. And now the livestock has disappeared. So I am just using the grass areas that we have. And there are some areas that do have ecologic agriculture and they have um, some ecologic projects, but the idea of the project one of the bases is a direct relationship with a consumer, direct sale that is based in trust, really. And the objective or the aspiration would be to become an example of rehabilitation of the rural area. And the main problem that we have in these areas of, of Spain, this um, area that we call the empty Spain, because people are leaving the rural areas. We have lots of problems, climate change problems, social problems, financial problems. So. With this regenerative livestock farming, we hope to become an option that will stop this degradation of rural areas. That's me in the field, so that you can get an idea of what the field looks like. 
Characteristics of the project, well, infrastructures, they're, com they're portable and the investment is very low. This allows to a young person like me who doesn't have many resources to do this. I thought it was impossible because I thought livestock farming, I would need lots of warehouses, machinery, that's impossible, so much money needs to be invested. But with this model, the investment is really low because everything is portable with just a bit of um, infrastructure like that, such as um, these these pools for the cows to drink and the the, uh, the water is, is taken from, from this uh, public fountain in the in the village i just charge it in my car and i take it to the cows and we need some electric fencing and that is it that's all the material and investment that i require now everything the livestock farming is controlled and monitored and everything has been monitored since we started three years ago we know where the animals are every day how long what that place looks like so that we can have a registry and so that we can see the evolution so uh, we do it in all of the area i am profiting from all the ways all the all the areas that are available such as the mountains and the hills and we in winter we are in a very um, small area that is a bit more protected but in summer we're closer to the rivers and which are um, under shadows so what we try to do is to constantly adjust the speed of movement of our cows with the rate of recovery of the plant so this is another uh, picture of me handling the livestock and the impact that this is having in the environment well in only one year this whole area you can see what it looked like before the livestock it had been abandoned for a very long time as you can see everything is oxidated it's old it doesn't allow for the new plants to grow and after two years um, this is in the same um, same time of year it's in february you see that it's completely different now the plants are getting light they're being stimulated so they're starting to grow this is another area uh, this is a change of um, after a year time here you see that good livestock good managed livestock has that impact this is um, um, an old compacted area and now we see that the air is getting in and it has changed and here you have a few brush strokes of something that I believe has a, a very big potential in these cereal, cereal areas of the of the peninsula. Here you see that big slopes that should never be uh, worked on, they're now becoming prairies, prairies with biodiversity and they should only be used to produce meat. This is the revolution really. So in these areas, they are the ones degrading the earth, contaminating, polluting, and, and they are ruining themselves to produce cereal, to uh, feed cows that should not eat cereal. So we should go from that to just produce livestock, to have grass, to feed cows, and that would regenerate the soil and we would have fertile soil again that would allow you to produce uh, food. So this is a practical example of a very specific lot, um, a plot of land with uh, conventional agriculture. This was um, this was a traditional traditional crop uh, with sunflowers. Here you see the marks of erosion of the land. Here you see that it, this seals the, the, the soil. It does not uh, allow for air or water to to come in and the next the next rain coming would simply um, drag all of that surface and take it to to the rivers and you lose all of that fertile um, cover so how did we start this regeneration well the first year we planted a mix of um, of different grasses uh, we had the ones uh, we had forage crops, the ones that are perennial and the ones that were seasonal, both of them are mixed because perennial are smaller, they're difficult to install. So in order to have a progressive progression and more um, and more cost effective, we decided to have a mix so that we can use it from the first uh, year. And that's why we decided to do that mix. So we decided to do this mix with different seeds and and this was in spring, we planted in, in fall, and the next uh, spring we had our cows come, come to this area for grassing. So here you see the yearly uh, grassing crops, you see that they're very big and people said, oh, you're, um, why are you leaving that, that 
that forage there, those forage crops. And I said, no, I want them there to protect the soil. So that summer, here you see to your left, the conventional um, neighbor who had already harvested the cereal. And to your right, you have all of the regenerative um, foraging crop that had already been stamped on by the cows. So it rained a lot during those days. And 15 days later, look at our uh, crop and look at the neighbors. So after all of that water, our conventional uh, neighbor had already started working on the soil and the perennial forage had already started capturing the, the energy of the sun. They had already started working on the soil, but the commercial neighbor had already um, left his, his soil naked, exposed to degradation again. So as I said, they were losing CO2, water, organic uh, matter, they lost biodiversity. So this, this is something that leads to desertification, but ours goes the other way around. All the cycles are working, so that allows us to have fertile soil. And the next year, after the rains, I replanted because because the prairie was not completely formed. So I started uh, planting perennial and seasonal uh, forage crops on top of the peri and as you can see then we see the, the winter go by this was in winter as well but our conventional neighbor as you can see has a cereal growing but you see that the soil is completely um, naked but ours is completely covered and the green plants are working this is the aspect in winter this is what it looked like as you can see the soil is already getting in shape it's already covered and then spring and we see the eclosion of flowers that is happening and the conventional neighbor um, sees his barley grow, but his soil is, is naked for a very long time. And here you have the same picture. So it's just one, one monoculture with a, a chemical package. So even if it's green, it's a biological de desert uh, filled with herbicides and pesticides and agrotoxic um products but to your to your right you have over 15 species that are planted over 30 uh, wild species that i could identify so there is a great biodiversity with insects with uh, beetles and so on this is spring so we had our cows once again in the prairie and as they were grassing there you would see they would be there for a day or half a day and then they would go to the next to the next lot of land um, they wouldn't have to do absolutely everything and then after they leave the soil is still covered and here we have there the manure this is very important with those little spots that are the work of the beetles and all the insects that are working on that manure i'm sorry andres but you've already talked for 11 minutes so you only have one left and here you have the pictures of what mm, what they're doing here you have the different uh plots of land that cows are being in. So here you have the barley with your conventional neighbor and our animals. And here you, the animals have already left. And you see that barley is already mature here, but the regenerative, you see it's still green. It's always green. A month after, I'm sorry, a month after the cows left, that was green again, it had grown, and then I once again planted some seeds so that it could still settle. So there was this was summer, and the conventional neighbor has already um, gotten, has already harvested. This is the aspect it currently has, and if there is rain, everything should start up again. So right now the prairie looks looks very good, and I'm still waiting for it to to look to look even better, but it already looks great. So this is just for you to see an aspect. In only two years, you can see the difference. If things are done well, the soil wants to heal itself and it does so quite quickly. So that's all we're doing. Thank you all very much. And I think that's something we should all remember, especially those of us who are younger, that the regeneration of the soil is really the uh, job that our generation has to put in place. So thank you all very much for everything. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for that interesting presentation. It was an amazing presentation with all the pictures and the practical example. And thank you for respecting the time given to you. And we will now give the floor to Andrei Novakovsky 
who is going to talk to us about the European perspective. What are the strategies that the EU is adopting through the Common Agricultural Policy for the conservation of soil? So, Andre, the floor is yours whenever you want. Hello. So, um, I will speak in English. Thanks for the translation. Um, I first want to divide it into three. I want to divide the talk into three parts. I've prepared uh, notes, so uh, we'll share these notes with you afterwards. Um, uh, and these will be translated as well into Spanish. Uh, so that don't worry about the details, they're all coming later. So uh, the first part I wanted to talk about what exists in the common agricultural policy in the, in the CAP, in the PAC. Um, and the first part I wanted to talk to you was about what we call conditionality or condicionalidad. In, in Spanish, uh, how that's changed in the reform that's just being negotiated. Uh, then I wanted to talk in the second part uh, about the um, the new elements of the of the cap reform, which is which are called eco schemes, uh, how they can be used. And in the last part, I wanted to talk about. Um, the soil framework directive, because there's some calls for uh, the same kind of approach that we have for water. So we have a water framework directive, but we're also thinking, about, uh, thinking about having a soil framework directive. So um, if we go to if we go to the um, the cap and the soil. So since 2003, uh, there's been a system we've called cross condition uh, cross compliance or conditionality. Uh, this is a list of basic good farming practices, uh, which uh, of which some of them relate to soil. So, for, and these have been in the past; they've been annexed to um, um, uh, the horizontal regulation of the cap of the Common Agricultural Policy, uh, and now they're let, they're they're annexed to the um, to the main strategic plans regulation. Um, so these are, for example, uh, some. I don't, so these will be in the notes, of course, later. But uh, what we used to have a thing called greening in the in the cap since two thousand and thirteen, uh, and in greening it took up some of the elements which used to be formerly in cross in cross compliance or conditionality. So a lot of these things are being recycled since two thousand and three, but the relevant ones are maintaining permanent pasture. This is now uh, the so-called good agricultural practice one. Uh, this has the, the aim of limiting um, um, the conversion of, from, of permanent pasture to arable. The problem with this is it's limited by a practice that we call refreshing of pasture. Um, the, the control systems consider that the, uh, the, the, um, the land use remains the same. If the farmer is simply declaring for five years, uh, grassland, 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 and then it becomes permanent grassland. So if grass is grown on arable for five years, it becomes permanent grassland. The problem is, of course, uh, you can plow up every year if you wanted to, or you can plow up every, after three years or after four years. Most people plow just before the fifth year, just to stop it from being trapped as uh, as as permanent grassland um, of course if you refresh the pasture you plow um, you reseed uh, with uh, with hybrid grasses or whatever or with uh, with grasses which are more productive you lose the carbon every time you're plowing you're losing carbon you're also losing the biodiversity which may have accumulated in the in the mixture in the sward um, in the mixture of grasses and so on and, and herbs so there's a, there was a limitation there, then there's still a limitation there. Uh, then there was another practice, which was the banning of, of burning stubble. Stubble is what's left. It's also the stubble left over after, after shaving, but it's the same principle. After, after mowing uh, or, or uh, harvest, you have, this, you have the grass left over from harvest. Sorry, the, the stems of the, the stalks of the, of the, the, the grasses left over after harvest. This used to be burned and that's not, it's no longer permitted to be burned. Then you have one which is about, you can't plow against the slope. This is to prevent gully erosion. And then a very important one, grass, uh, vegetation cover 
um, of the soil, so it should never be left bare. That's the, perhaps the most important one, of course, as some of the previous speakers have mentioned. Uh, there has been also since 2003 um, also a rule on crop rotation. Since 2013, this became diluted in a way in a practice what they call diversification, which is a kind of a weaker, more flexible version of real rotation. Um, we wanted that to include leguminous crops uh, inside uh, inside this rule, but uh, that wasn't we didn't succeed there. Uh, and the idea is that all these rules, um, every farmer has to abide by them, respect them, in order to get 100% of the of the payments. Now, there are a lot of limitations with these cross compliance rules or these conditionality rules. Um, mainly, the control rate is only uh, you only have one in 100 chances of being checked. <laughs> so the control rate is very is, is very low is 1%. And then most farmers, uh, it's basically a weak system. It's a weak control and sanction system. Most of the, uh, if you're in breach of any of those rules, you're most likely, the most, like, the most likely option is that you will get a, a warning letter. So it's 0% sanction. Um, and then the next most common sanction is, is 1%. Um, so it's a very weak, uh, uh, system people don't really care if you break if you break the rules you're likely to get 99 percent of your payment instead of 100 percent of your payment so uh, people don't really mind so much if about breaking the rules or not um it's worth just to mention uh, one extra rule which was added uh, most of those rules of course were maintained over these last uh, few uh, 10 or uh, 20 years um one rule which was added in this last reform was protecting wetlands and peatlands. Uh, this one has a great potential, in, especially in the more wet, uh, more humid, more damp, more cold, uh, northwest of Europe with the Atlantic influence. Um, because we've, it has the potential of re-wetting uh, degraded peatlands and wetlands. So there's a carbon, we can, the idea is to re, uh, to re-establish uh, these peat bogs and to re-establish this carbon sinking function of the, of the wetlands and the peatlands. So maybe there's going to be, that's maybe the only positive thing which the cap, the next cap will, um, the next cap will bring. Um, yeah. There are of course a lot of loopholes and exemptions which have been carried over from the previous, uh, from the previous uh, regulation. So those are all the limitations of those things. Another, so we move to the second part, which is about these eco schemes. So these eco schemes are um, a new invention, if you like. It's using money from the so called first pillar of the cap, so the, the direct payments of the cap. Um, and uh, it's enabling to be, it, the idea is to enable those funds up to 25% of, of those funds to be used for uh, transition. So to transitioning for, to more, more sustainable forms of agriculture. The, the limitation of this is there's lots of loopholes again that the member states have managed to negotiate because it's very tough negotiations. Um, they can spend much less than that 25% if they wish. Uh, and they can, um, there's competition that like we would like, I mean, ideally, we would love for all these things to be spent in agroecological uh, method or in me methods, agroecological practices, uh, like, for example, uh, the political culture, which is this rewetting of peatlands, um, uh, rewetting of old degraded peatlands, for example. Uh, again, we have to look out for the loopholes that in, in because some allow plowing and so on, which was contra contrary to the to the idea behind it. Um, the you know other techniques could be uh, agroforestry, alley cropping, where you plant the arable crops between rows of trees, uh, mixed cropping, so polycultures, um, rotational or mob grazing, which we've just seen uh, the, both from New Mexico and from Spain, as two examples from the previous speakers. Um, um, well, all these kind of agroecological techniques. The problem is these ag agroecological techniques are in competition for this 
pot of funds, so this new 25% maximum of, of, of funds. Uh, what are they competing against? They're competing against things like digitization or uh, uh, precision farming or uh, animal welfare. Now you might think, well, those things could be okay. They could be good. The problem is that they don't really deal with the problem of dependency of imports, you, the, the dependency of farmers on imports. Maybe they reduce uh, the imports, but then the farmers have different dependencies, financial dependencies from debt, for example, or their data is no longer theirs, or the machines are generating the data or collecting data from the fields. The agrochemical companies know exactly how much fertilizers or pesticides they need, so it's just uh, helping this system, the old system. It's not really transitioning to a new system, to a new agroecological agro paradigm. Um, there is, yeah, I also wanted to talk a little bit about this, um, this whole idea of, of carbon farming. Now this, I, carbon farming will be one of the pillars, one of the four pillars so-called of, of these eco schemes. The other, there's agroecology, there's digitization, there's carbon farming, and there's animal welfare. Um, just before I go there, I would say like with animal welfare, you would say, well, it's good that things are being spent on animal welfare, but the problem is those funds could be spent just to incre increase the welfare of animals a tiny bit, uh, instead of putting it wholesale towards uh, a transition, transition to a, new, a whole new system, a whole new paradigm. Uh, and effectively there are other, spend other funds that could be used. So it's a kind of, a, it's also a diversion. Sorry, so then just to go back to this carbon farming technique, uh, this far carbon farming idea, we don't know fully how carbon behaves in the soil. Um, we, don't, we know that, for example, the Amazon rainforest can switch from being a sink to a source, uh, uh, depending on, the, on, on droughts and so on. Uh, so depending on drought or flood uh, or uh, many different aspects. Uh, we don't know how soil behaves. Also, be between one field, you can have differences in, in, in soil and so on. Um, so whatever happens, we need to be able to scrutinize the content of what the member states are proposing for these, um, these eco-schemes. Luckily, <laughs> they will have to write down precisely what the content of these eco-schemes uh, what they will propose. Now, at the end of this year, um, the member states have a deadline in order to provide, um, in order to provide uh, the draft uh, cap strategic plans. The the cap strategic plans um, will uh, will contain. Um, uh, they have to contain all the detailed. Uh, um, uh, sorry, there's just some, some noise in the background. Um, they have to contain the, um, um, the detailed techniques or the detailed uh, practices uh, which, which the, um, um, which these eco schemes would, would, be, would be made up of. Um, that Andrei, way we can have... Está terminando el tiempo. Llevas 13 minutos. Si oh, sorry, but you've already been talking for 13 minutes and okay. uh, you're running out of time. So if that's all right, well, that, you could you conclude was, and that, then we'll go to the questions. Yeah. Good. Well, to conclude, all that's needed is all that's needed to be said is that we need we need scrutiny. And to conclude, I will just tell you about um, we need, uh, the scrutiny will come from uh, the public the publication of the strategic plans and uh, civil society and NGOs to be able to look at what, what the thing is. And there's, there's platforms like Por Una Otra, Una Otra Pac, which is part of a European network called Good Food, Good Farming. Uh, and we're looking together at all the draft strategic plans uh, in order to make sure that the ambition is high, because it's really important that we have this transition and not just uh, member states uh, doing the same business as usual. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Andre. And it was really um, a hard bone, the one that we left you to introduce. 
those of you in the EU uh, really have a hard job because you have to understand everything that's at play and you have to work in order to, to really push for policies that really are worth our, um, our efforts. So I would like to thank to all the speakers for their presentations. You have been very clear and you have really respected the time that was given to you. So we have some time for questions. We're going to try and be quick. So for Pilar, we have a question which says, what do you think is the impact of urban planning and um, territory organization with regards to soil from the point of view of, of soil, which is the one that you touched upon? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, let me see how how should i begin answering that question let's say that quite recently the problem all over europe and in many other places but in europe we see that there is an intensification of the competition for the use of soil so the same plot of land or a specific extension of land is being um, competed against for different uses for urban planning or an airport or agriculture or preservation lots of different things people fight to decide what the use of that specific plot of land will be. So these uses can sometimes be compatible when we organize the territory and when we decide what is going to be done and when we decide what's the use we're going to give to each unit, then we have to think that sometimes they're compatible in time. For instance, uh, forestry can be compatible with recreational purposes. You can have a stroll down the woods in woods that are exploited and so you have both leisure and forestry at the same time that's a classical example what's not compatible at the same time would be for instance urban planning with agriculture if you're going to build buildings the soil is completely destroyed and it's destroyed and wherever the building and when it's not well um the, the urban planning is not well done and it has been sealed with concrete. There's no other use that can be given to that soil. No other service can be provided. Nothing can be done in that area. So we have to be very careful when we give a certain use to an area, we have to see what uses are compatible. And we also need to look in the long term what we want and what is compatible in time. So we have to see whether the use that we are given a certain a certain plot of land, whether it is reversible or not, because and if if the deterioration or the use of a plot would have an impact in other environmental uses, we have to look about whether it is degrading or not. Because when we stop agriculture, we could revert to a good meadow or a good forest. But if the use is very intense, we will not be able to revert it. And that is what happens with, with urbanization. So that's what we need to take into account, compatibility in space and time. Okay, thank you, Pilar. I'm going to try and be fast at this, about that because there are many, many different questions. There are some questions for Ray. Now, if you could translate them for him. There are three questions. So one would be, whether it's more expensive to reproduce the agricultural system, although I think he tried to explain it isn't more expensive, if we can directly plant seeds of, uh, of orchards with, uh, with fruit bearing trees. And it, someone was asking about whether the direct uh, planting systems also um, need to be done with herbicides. And in your presentation, you also showed an image with eggs and you talked about transgenic eggs. I don't know if it was a, a, a mistake in the translation or if you really know that there are transgenic eggs being marketed right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, the picture of the eggs was about uh, eggs uh, when the uh, chickens use non GMO feed. And so the feed makes the difference with this GMO, gen genetically modified organisms. And here in the United States, there's a huge, uh, and, and people don't understand that a majority of the Americans do not want genetically modified organisms, uh, genetically modified corn, like for Roundup and herbicide. And so the grain, the quality, how the grain is raised, and if it's genetically modified, makes a difference. That was first I wanted to show that. And I, I wish, Maria, I would have cut down my slides because I would have done slowly more uh, 
but I get so excited about it, there's too much information. But then back to the, um, my understanding, Maria, you were talking about the, uh, the orchard and planting covers on the bottom of it. Is that, is that what you were asking? And uh, can you repeat that again, Maria? Yeah. There's a question about whether it was uh, possible to do direct planting of uh, fruit trees. I understand that yeah. after harvesting, after you would harvest, I, I don't know, for instance, legumes or, or cereals, can you plant trees after that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the things that we have been doing is in, in the country, a lot of times, pecan, when we started doing cover crops, on pecans, apple trees. One of the biggest uh, pushbacks from, from, uh, from farmers was, well, how am I gonna harvest the nuts? How am I gonna harvest the, uh, the, uh, the apples? Because we do mechanical harvesting. So what we do is we plant covers that you, they'll eventually be perennials. They come up on their own. So we mow really, really short. When it's time to harvest, then you can, the machine can still harvest the nuts or harvest the apples. So we've been doing this in apples, pecans, walnuts, not a problem. That is a, uh, it's just a matter of engineering and making sure that you learn logistically those critical times because you, you know that walnut, got, uh, walnut producers, they gotta be able to pick those nuts. That's how they make their living. So that was very critical. So the neat thing about it is uh, designing cover crops or plants or uh, permanent covers that you can Gray, I mean, graze shortly or mow shortly so that it's easy to, uh, to pick up the fruits or the nut or whatever you're going to do. Now, Maria, can you help me with that first question again? You had three questions and, and you can give me the first one again. Sí, la otra era sobre la economía. Another question had to do with economy. Now, from a financial standpoint, is it more expensive to work with a natural system, this natural agriculture system, or with a conventional system? Yes, thank you, Maria. No, and again, uh, because I went so quickly, it is when you work against the natural system, it is way more expensive. The moment you go to no-till, you drop your fuel use by 66%. It costs a lot of money to create dirt. Tillage is very expensive, very, uh, uh, um, it destroys the soil habitat, diminishes the fungi, but it takes a lot of diesel and horsepower to diminish the soil. So it is way cheaper to plant no-till and cover crops. And the cover crops that we're growing help smother the weeds. So we're able to eliminate huge amounts of herbicide. In fact, Rick Clark, no herbicide. We mechanically kill the cover crop. When the cover crop reaches a certain maturity, cereal rye is very sensitive to mechanical damage and we can lay the whole cover crop down so we don't have to use chemicals. But here's the kicker. It takes a lot of management to get to organic no-till. So I never recommend producers to start off, when I work with producers, I slowly get them off the chemicals, off the chemicals and then move them into organic no-till. It takes a lot of management and skill set to get to organic no-till. A lot of people don't understand, you cannot get farmers out of chemicals and fertilizer right away, or they'll go financially broke. They need to understand that the soil is addicted to fertilizer, chemicals, and all these herbicides, mostly bacteria dominant soils. So they're not healthy enough to transition somebody into organic no-till right away. So the bottom line, you save huge, huge amounts of money mimicking nature. That's why we're going down this direction because the farmers, get financial freedom from the chemical companies and from the government. This is exciting. When you mimic nature, it's one word, freedom. Freedom from everybody. Muchas gracias, Rey. Ahora hay una pregunta para Andrea. Thank you so much, Rey. There is a question for Andrea now. Andrea, are you here? Are you there? You're listening? This is a question complaint. Begoña Izquierdo was saying, how is it possible that industrial livestock companies in micro exploitations that are not sustainable, such as the one that we have in Caparroso, 
uh, which have a 19 files uh, sanctioning, them, uh, sanctioning them for the impact that they have caused in a biosphere protection area can get up to 600,000 euros from the CAP. And if the new CAP is going to set some corrective measures for these uh, situations and these problems that we currently face. Um, well, essentially, the, the, san the sanctioning system, which I touched upon uh, quite briefly in the, in the presentation, has not changed between the new cap and the, new, uh, the old cap. Um, I mean, it, it, when I said most farmers get 0% sanctions or, and then the next most common uh, sanction is, is a 1% sanction, it's not, it, it show, it's actually, you can go all the way up to complete exclusion, but it's extremely rare. It's extremely, I used to be auditing these, uh, these, this kind of uh, cost compliance system for the European Commission. It is extremely rare. Uh, first, because you have to find them in this 1% of the control sample, in, this, in the inspection sample. Uh, and then the control and the sanction matrix has to be tough enough to, to find that. Um, most sanctions would be, of course, of a higher level. Um, in some member states, it goes up to uh, you know, 30%. And if it's repeated, it can be 100% exclusion. But it's not, it's extremely, extremely, extremely rare. Um, and in, in the answer to the question is, well, um, it's a weakness of the system. And that's not going to, that's not changing. But then, that, therefore, we just rely on... Uh, we rely on NGOs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. It is really sad, but we will try to, to change this. And maybe from different instances. We only have time for two more questions. One is for... Andres from Gran Jazael, Juan Manuel asks, what sort of seeds have you used? And then there is another question for Pilar, saying what's the effect of the slurry of water treatment plants in the soil? I'm sorry, but we don't have time for more questions. So the time has been previously said, so you can obviously ask more questions and we will send them to the speakers if we can. Okay, so as I said during the presentation, I did a mix of uh, um, uh, perennial plants and yearly plants. As for the yearly plants, we have, for instance, uh, some, some uh, plants such as uh, oats and some graminaceous in general, but we also have other other seeds such as a carob, which is in the in the area and that are very important for the regeneration of the soil and the uh, capture of nitrogen and nitrogen and since we needed to recover this i thought about these uh, seeds and as for the perennial we had a mix of different species also graminaceous such as uh, festuca for instance and dactylus and then we also had um lotus white uh, triple we had uh actually uh, just a mix of um, of the ones that are adapted to the specific conditions of this area such as alfalfa because we have drought in the winter and and intense heat in the summer thank you thank you andres pilar slurry from water treatment plants how do you see that okay slurry from water treatment plants i have i have fought against slurry for a very long time well it has been chosen i mean you have to be very careful not turning um, the soil into to landfill and slurry has lots of organic matter and it comes from our houses and it has organic matter coming from our uh, water closets obviously so that is a source of uh, a very uh, high source of carbon but the problem is that not only does it have this organic matter it also has multiple contaminants why well and pollutants because in industrial waters and urban areas we we see that usually the uh, rain also goes all the way to those water treatment plants that should be separated. So it's not just the water coming from our sewage systems and from our homes, but also all of the water that fell from the rain and that went through balconies and soil and has um, 
heavy metal and a residue of fuel from all the traffic in the city. So the problem with these slurries from water treatment plants is that they have a very high amount of pollutants, of heavy metals that have, and we have um, limits established of how, what the content should be. And then dangerous organics um, as well that are not, uh, that are, not limited by the legislation and we never know if it would be there i mean some crazy person could simply throw mercury down their drain and we would have a problem with a slurry so there needs to be a very strict control of the different batches of slurry that are used to guarantee that we don't have those pollutants in them and we need to compass them and we need to post treat those slurries to stabilize them or we could have very serious problems so yes they can be used but they should be controlled in order to use them and there needs to be environmental control by the different regions the different administrations and the different entities that are responsible for this control because this environmental surveillance is not always the one we should have and sometimes things are being done that shouldn't be okay perfect thank you so much pilar well, they say here that that is the reason why they are forbidden in ecological agriculture due to the heavy metals and substances that could be there. So thank you. Thank you so much for your answers, for your questions and for the session in general. I it has it has I mean, the time has flown. I, I just I, I thought we had more time, but we hadn't. So th thank you so much. And I think that after this afternoon, we have a clearer idea of what is happening with our soil and what are the tools that we have in order to solve this situation. So um, from regenerative agriculture and raising awareness so that people know that soil needs to be alive and the soil needs to be able to carry out its, its tasks really and to just disseminate this message to 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 every citizen so that with our purchasing um, behavior we can we can somehow redirect things and that is all i wanted to say thank you very much i will give the floor to the organizers so that they might conclude this session okay so we thank you all for having been here thank you so much maria jose for this amazing moderation you have done and i would like to thank everyone especially ray because he had he is in a different time zone and all of you who have registered to this session will be receiving an email with the links to the different videos whenever they're um, available and the presentations if our speakers care to to share them and i'm sorry i'm really sorry next week we will have the water session um so you'll see that we will talk about the mar menor uh, region in in spain so elisa should you would you like to take the floor to conclude yes well that was extremely educational very illustrative thank you so much i've learned a lot from the first moment that pilar started talking till the end with the questions i've been fascinated by everything that has been said so thank you so much and i'm sure that the next sessions will be just as interesting 